The chemistry of the planet is anchored in the ocean. There's a legendary oceanographer, Dr. Sylvia Earle, and she often says, why is it that scuba divers are some of the strongest advocates of ocean conservation? Because they've personally seen the beauty, the fragility, even the degradation of our planet's blue heart. 80% of marine trash comes from land-based sources. So when we dive in places around the region, we see all sorts of things from our daily lives. The more I've come to realize how important the ocean is, the more motivated I've been to contribute towards a clean and vibrant ocean. My name is Kathleen Tan, and I don't want this documentary to be about me. Kathleen Tan is heir to the Rumour Group, a prominent family business in Singapore which specialises in real estate development. As its philanthropy director, Kathleen manages a diverse portfolio of conservation-focused investments. When I started my conservation journey, I reached out to a nonprofit, and they do a citizen science program called Dive Against Debris. They encourage scuba divers to go out in the ocean and help protect it by surveying marine debris that they find. Oh, broken glass. Be careful. What we do is we collect it, we sort the items out, we then record what kinds of items they are by material. And then we dispose of it carefully. Before COVID, I scuba dived quite a bit, so at least once a month, I'd say. I started diving first at the Great Barrier Reef more than 10 years ago. I had no idea that there was so much life below the waves. Being able to see that with your own eyes, you have a relationship with it. You come to love it and get to know it better, which makes you more empowered and motivated to protect it. You can feel a little hopeless and lost and overwhelmed at times. It's, it's such a wicked problem and there's so many complexities. But getting your hands dirty, I think you're surrounded by people who feel equally passionate and that can be very inspiring. Six point two. We actually lock every single item very meticulously. One. One. Okay. One plastic cup. Eventually, the information gets uploaded to an international portal where everybody else can get access to. So the whole idea is to help people understand that there are a lot of trash in the area, and more importantly, to get people to work together and also for better management measures so that we can have a clean and safe ocean for everyone. I don't think so. 11.1. 11.1, okay. Yep. Today's dive, fantastic. We only have four people, but we managed to pick up about 27 kg of stuff. 7.5. Yeah, 7.5. We also picked up a tyre, 
which is quite a common sight in Singapore, underwater. The tyre itself could not have been floated in from elsewhere. It's probably by dumping, so we need to make sure our boaters are responsible as well. Eight kilos. Yes. Eight kilos. Marine debris is a very complex issue, and it's not something that the public agencies or the volunteer groups can do alone. So having businesses on board is very important, largely because they expand our networks, they help us see things from the various perspectives, and they provide the resources so that we can actually go out and clean our oceans. Catherine's day job is overseeing impact investments for her family office, Rumor Group. Rumor has a strategic stake in real estate development company GYP Properties, where Kathleen also serves as its sustainability director. GYP stands for Global Yellow Pages, a nod to what used to be the company's bread and butter. Being in a sunset industry, we looked for different avenues to diversify the business and eventually we ended up in real estate, which is where both my father as well as uh, other directors on the board had a lot of experience in and felt that it could be the future for the company. Karen and I were just now just in the warehouse looking at the e-waste. Today, the company is on a path to make their buildings greener. Kathleen works with different stakeholders to meet a net zero carbon emissions target. We should go ahead to look into electrical, uh, electric vehicle charging stations. Mm -hmm. um, so I asked Karen to put together some quotes. Um, actually, something else I wanted to ask was about the air conditioning. Is there a way to increase the temperature by a couple of degrees? Since there are less people in the office at the moment, lower occupancy, it would be colder for people who are in here too, but also saves energy by increasing the temperature a little bit. A key part of Kathleen's role is assessing pitches from startups and research institutes to fund their sustainability projects. One of its latest beneficiaries is the Good Food Institute, a non-profit which seeks to accelerate innovation in the alternative proteins sector. If we look at the emissions coming from global livestock, it's 14.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. That is more than the combined transportation sector. If we look at investments, only 6 billion US dollars has, it, has been invested into alternative proteins as of the end of last year, while there is a whopping 50 billion US dollars invested in electric vehicles and their um, charging equipment. So there's a huge gap between these two sectors. I just wanted to highlight two specific projects that your donations have gone through, and these are seriously critical um, research projects. So the first that I wanted to highlight is the muscle and fat cell line development of ROHU. Um, and also investigations of these self differentiations and mechanisms. So why is this very important? The availability of cell lines, um, and especially fat cell lines, um, remains a major barrier for cultivated seafood. Alternative proteins is an example of where innovative technology meets conservation. Food tech companies are bringing to market alternatives that compete with their traditional animal counterparts and give consumers more options. See if we can keep it and turn it into green features for, for the people here, whether it's running track, whether it's children playground, vertical farming. There's a wonderful concept that's happening at the moment called microforest. Mm -hmm. or even mini forests, so it could be the size of a parking lot or the size of a tennis court, where they use that area to plant to encourage biodiversity, um, as well as help fight climate change. Uh, that ran across the line. For years, Kathleen's father, Stanley Tan, put his money behind humanitarian causes, such as helping poverty-stricken communities. But under Kathleen's direction, the family office diversified its investments and funding to cover a vast range of sustainability projects. 
think there's probably a question of how. Many of us, myself included, don't look at the environment and the climate issue, not because it's not sexy, but because it's far more daunting, it's far harder. Whereas, let's say, in the areas that I serve, I can actually, you know, uh, measure and say, so many lives have been affected, so many lives have been changed, illnesses uh, have found cure, and that's easier to motivate and satisfy yourself. But if you take ocean, for example, even throughout the life of care, all she can do is to initiate, start something, uh, at best maybe prototype a solution and hope it will scale. Hers is an area where it requires the whole of humankind to get involved. So I see that as far more ambitious. And uh, a lot of us are scared of that. Working on environmental issues requires a lot of patience and often are very long-term projects. But I think it's so important that we continue to do so. You know, in our family, we have our nephews and our niece, and I think it's important to me that we can look, out, look at them in the eye and tell them that we've tried everything that we can to deliver them a future which they can thrive in as well. So your gut feel with the eight O and five of them, how did it's it? It's too big. I guess. I'm surprised. Yeah. Kathleen divides her time between working for the family business and running Coastal Natives, a non-profit organization she founded to help realize her vision of creating a clean and vibrant ocean. We run a variety of events and programs uh, to introduce uh, the ocean to people who don't uh, have a relationship with it uh, and to try and show them ways that they can act for the ocean. Do you remember when we get out to lift, there was a curved wall on the left side? Mm -hmm. So we thought we could do the intro panel. Um, like a standee? Over the past few months, Kathleen and her associate Adlin have been working hard to organize the Waves of Change Festival to be held at the Art Science Museum. The event will host film screenings, kids' workshops, and an augmented reality art exhibition, all done to make people more aware of threats to marine environments, like overfishing, plastic pollution, and climate change. I really do believe that without appreciation, there can't be um, the want to conserve nature, but if you bring them one step further and let them see that, okay, yes, the collapse of the ecosystem meant that you might not have this resource anymore. So if you find that link for them, if there's a personal touch, then people tend to uh, reciprocate better. Have you ever seen cuttlefish out there? Because I've, only, I've seen multiple octopus. I was working as a dive master in the weekends on a, on a liver boat that was going into Malaysia and Indonesia. <laughs> One weekend, Kath was on board. And I went diving with my group, and very quickly we saw whale shark, which is very rare in these waters. So I popped up to the surface and yelled, whale shark, whale shark, and everybody from the boat jumped in to see the whale shark. That's how I got to speak to Kath, and we kind of spent the afternoon on the way back just sitting and chatting about diving and our passion for the ocean. That's how it started. We've seen these before. I think the problem is they're so beautiful that they catch them for the aquarium trade. Yeah, they catch them from the wild. And then they, a lot of them die in travel. Um, so it's, it's really... Whether you're talking about plastic pollution, uh, whether you're talking about climate change, shark and, and ray preservation, those are all areas where we're working against the tide. And I think Kath can sometimes get very frustrated uh, around the lack of, of progress. I feel that uh, as long as we do what we can and do the right thing, it might be we're swimming against the tide, but perhaps we're making the tide go a little bit slower. <laughs>
since joining the family business 10 years ago, Kathleen Tan has made tackling overfishing a key priority. Ninety percent of global fish stocks are either overfished or fished to maximum sustainable levels. And yet in Asia, meat and seafood consumption is projected to rise by 78 percent between 2017 and 2050. We are literally emptying the ocean. So where will all this fish come from? These stats are alarming because it shows how unsustainable a path we are on right now, and we are on the edge and we need to change the ways that we do things fast. The saying that there's plenty of fish in the sea is becoming less and less relevant. The family put two and two together and decided that we wanted to get involved in alternative seafood. Kathleen and her family's business have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars supporting research on alternative proteins. Hi, so nice to meet you. My name is Yinzhen. Today, Kathleen is at the Food Innovation and Resource Center at Singapore Polytechnic. She's on the lookout for more opportunities to invest in the sector, one that's growing rapidly in Singapore. FIRC have invented uh, two new alternative proteins, one being a plant-based abalone and the other being a fishless patty. These caught my eye because I think as consumers have more choices, it'll allow us to be more uh, intentional in our food choices. It's easier and more straightforward to mimic something like minced meat mm. in the form of a burger or a sausage compared to, say, a whole cut, a whole muscle cut, like your steak or your chicken breast. Mm -hmm. yeah. So similarly for alternative proteins for seafood, it's more difficult to create the whole muscle cuts, like your filet, and also to have a texture that is more uh, delicate as well as flaky. What can businesses and investors do to support FIRC's work in this area? Businesses can actually partner up with FIRC and we can support them in their plant-based innovation journey. There's a range of services that FRC do, including new product development, to process optimization, to shelf life extension, looking at consumer insights to find out whether the product is suitable for the consumers. Very excited to try this. I haven't had, you know what, I can't remember the last time I've had abalone, but fish patty maybe as a teenager. It's delicious. It's well cooked, crunchy. The flavor does taste fishy, um, but in a good way. Mm, very comforting. We're very excited about alternative seafood as a conservation tool. I think it addresses uh, climate change, for example, and destructive fishing practices. A lot of uh, bottom trawling releases carbon from the bottom of the seabed, and that can be detrimental. Sorry. <laughs> There's a lot of people watching. As you can see, I'm still eating it. <laughs> Whilst they're not focus specifically on uh, vegetarians, I think it's a good strategy that they're focusing on flexitarians um, to try and reduce the amount of meat and seafood being eaten rather than removing it from diets altogether. <laughs> it's so good. Okay, last one. Hi. Sound check? Yep. The mic. Check, check. <laughs> Keep it rolling from here. Huge shadow just flew by. Above us. Look up. <gasps> As sustainability director, Kathleen's role focuses much on outreach and education. 
spots on coral reefs where marine life come from near and far to get cleaned by smaller sea creatures, like cleaner wrasses, butterfly fish, and... The latest project is an upcoming festival called Waves of Change. There are audio journeys to marine environments designed specifically with one community in mind. The concept of these audio journeys, it's called blind diving, was that it was originally created for people with vision loss in mind. as threatened with extinction on the IUCN red list. Of I used to be legally blind uh, before I had surgery, and I think that really resonated with me, and uh, I wanted to, you know, explore this project and, and bring it to life. Yeah. We'll do another full yeah, take of that, okay? Everything. I'm just wondering the shh, that bit. And I, I faulted on the where marine life. I keep wanting to say We create a, a whole audio experience for anyone who has never been to a dive to experience what is it like to go diving at different locations around Southeast Asia. Think of visiting a cleaning station like visiting the dentist. While we get our teeth cleaned, mantas get their teeth, gills and skin cleaned. Listening to an audio work doesn't equate to protecting the environment, but creating that awareness that these things do exist. Seeing and hearing Kathleen's stories, I hope they will be able to also experience what I felt when I first heard her story. With big eyes and even... Being underwater is a different world and there are all kinds of different marine animals. I love them all, but I think sharks play a pivotal role in the ecosystem and they are sorely misunderstood. When you say shark, many people think of Jaws and the great white shark, but I think that instills fear in people. The average rate of shark attacks that are um, unprovoked ranges from four to 11 a year, whereas we humans kill up to 100 million sharks a year. And that number is just extremely overwhelming, isn't it? This is Naomi. She's a shark and ray scientist who Kathleen recently met at a virtual seminar. Kathleen was so impressed by Naomi's presentation that she engaged her as a consultant for a series of sustainability-themed articles that her company commissioned. Today, Kathleen is meeting her to discuss potential topics for future articles. Hey, Naomi. Hi, what are you working on? Uh, so this is a blue spotted mask ray. Um, so I'm just doing my usual dissections of them. Is this ray endangered? So this particular species is not endangered. It's actually near threatened. But it's important that we think about conservation for animals that aren't endangered. Absolutely. Because if we cared about them before they were endangered, they wouldn't become endangered in the first place. Absolutely. Overfishing in Southeast Asia is really bad. Um, in the South China Sea alone, um, fish stocks have crashed to less than 50% of what they were. And some fisheries are described as being on the brink of total collapse. But the truth is that actually, most sharks and rays are caught accidentally in fishing gear that is targeting other species like normal seafood. Mm. Um, and this is what is driving a lot of their population declines. I heard we have a shark specimen today as well. Uh, yep, let me just get it. Okay, here we go. So this is the uh, black spot shark, named so because it only has one black marking on its fin here. And this is actually a small bodied shark. So it doesn't actually grow much bigger than this. They will never actually exceed the length of this, this mat. So they're not more than about 18 inches. I'm sure they keep it together. Oh. <laughs> no, go. <laughs> this is a bit embarrassing, sorry. <laughs> Poor baby. <laughs> no, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Seeing the dead shark was very sad and heartbreaking. Um, it was a juvenile and didn't get to live its full life. And I'm so used to seeing them in the wild. Um, but I think it's amazing how committed Naomi is to procuring animals that are already dead for her work rather than going out to catch them live.
So we need to have science-based catch limits, regulations around fishing gear, fewer fishermen and fishing boats out in the ocean, and more marine protected areas so that nature can start to bounce back. Basically, we need to eat less and catch less. So in order to reduce the number of fishermen that we have out at sea, we need to provide alternative jobs for them so that you know, they still have a livelihood and can support their families. One way Kathleen is helping create alternative jobs for fishermen is by funding sustainable development projects overseas. A project in Timor-Leste is her latest. The Ata Uru Island project involves a marine protected area. So by creating sustainable livelihoods for the communities um, where they can have stable income, hopefully it will help to incentivize best practice management of the marine protected area. Hi, Mendes. How are things in East Timor at the moment and in Ata Uru Island? Hi, everyone. So Ata Uru Island is an extremely diverse place. Where no fishing is allowed, you see that fish populations uh, replenish themselves, right? With the coral reefs um, protected, you don't find uh, activities like dynamite fishing or overfishing happening. And so, of course, with uh, higher uh, fish supplies for the long term, this assures uh, the local population, um, protects their food security, but it also enables them to tap into other uh, alternative sources of livelihood. For example, ecotourism. Science has told us that reefs are able to buffer the energy from waves and storm surges. So I think that is a very good example of being able to mitigate the impacts of climate change and extreme weather. Restoration can also help with carbon sequestration. I think it could be a good model for sustainable development. That means you protect your natural areas, but you also protect benefits that people derive from nature in those areas. today. I'm so glad. We'll be leading off shortly to our designated area and then we'll clean up for about an hour, an hour and a half and then we'll do a survey to see what we've picked up and we'll weigh everything. Today we're here to clean the beach and bring our community together, raising awareness and reaching new audiences. So I, I think beach cleanup swap may not seem like a very impactful activity. Uh, it has the ability to create ripples of change. So, <laughs> that's great, awesome. If everyone could take photos and spread awareness, that would be great. Tulumben and we decided to go over to Ahmed for dinner. We crossed the bridge and under that bridge was a dry riverbed. And in that riverbed it had mountains and mountains of rubbish. It was just etched into my mind. And later I spoke to a local and I asked them what happens to all the rubbish. Does anyone come and pick it up? They said they wait for the monsoon season to come to wash it all away. I think loving marine life you can picture the threat and you see images of turtles entangled and whales with plastic bags in their stomach. But also it breaks my heart because it's preventable. If we had a robust system to deal with the rubbish that we create, this wouldn't be happening. Oh, oh, we can take this off. Today's beach cleanup was very productive. It has been such a big difference from what we saw from last year to this year, because as more people are coming out here to do these beach cleanups, we are now finally able to pick up the smaller pieces of plastic that are often swept in the coves and harder to reach areas. We 
are sending a message by coming out here that we are tired of the waste. We are tired of seeing this take over our natural face. And we're sending a message that we are going to keep taking action against it. Picking up the rubbish, we stop rubbish from flowing into the ocean, which then has effects of risk to marine life. Uh, for example, entanglements or ingestion by animals or even plastic covering corals and stopping them from making food. Waste management is definitely not a sexy topic, but I think the world is really waking up to the urgency of addressing the issue. In the short term, we might still see higher risk in terms of investment in this area. But if you look at the medium to long term risk, there's definitely a market for it. And I think the investment thesis is strong. So when it comes down to it, it's really how do we manage our risk as we try to advance this area. We've been living unsustainably for so long. But I think rather than looking at behavioral changes as inconveniences and losses, we could be looking at them as opportunities and choices. Choosing a future for your children where nature and people can thrive. To find out how her investments could reap better returns for the environment, Kathleen visits the Lee Kong Chien Natural History Museum. She's meeting Dr. Tan Hyok Hui, an expert in Southeast Asia's marine biodiversity. What advice would you have for philanthropists coming into the environmental sector for the first time? Well, cover your bases. For any conservation work to be successful, you have to know what's there. Because mm. otherwise, at the end of the day, people will say, OK, you've poured in this much money, but what are you protecting? Or what are your main aims? If you can't answer that, it's a big problem. If you have a flagship species, then your choice is very clear. If you choose the whale shark as a flagship species, as you know, whale sharks do migrate. Mm. So you, you, you can't really anchor them to one spot. Yes. In a sense. But you can attract them to your spot by maintaining the habitat. How do you verify that plastic pollution is an issue? From a very uh, real case study that we did, mm. in 2015, a uh, sperm whale washed up on Singapore shores. Normally, if you were to get a freshly dead body of a sperm whale, there will be remnants of its last meal. Mm. And that tends to be giant squids from deep waters, like 600 to 800 meters. But there was no trace of any bodies of giant squids, just plastics. Instant noodle preppers, drink bottles, mm. it's there. It's a really tough stance, I think, to remove plastics from everyday life. It's a very unfortunate thing that plastics have become such a necessity. It's mm. about education. Mm. If you do start at a younger age, it, it becomes part and parcel. To capture the imagination of the young, Kathleen is partnering Mesh Minds, a non-profit. So glad that you guys are coming on board the Ways of Change Festival and so excited to be doing the art exhibition. Mesh Minds uses art as a tool to champion sustainability. So we wanted to take you through some of the artworks that are available and see which ones could possibly work for you. Mm -hmm. And then that will make up... They are working on a series of augmented reality artworks. I love that. Yeah, this, oh, this one, yeah. These will grace the Waves of Change Festival, an event which Kathleen has spent the last nine months organising. And they are flexible on the inside. Oh, there we go. Often when we're dealing with environmental issues, they are existential threats, which can be very depressing to learn about. And I think what MeshMind does wonderfully is 
distills these messages in a way that's easy to absorb and that's fun and engaging and starts a conversation. So it might seem frivolous, but it's really a powerful tool for outreach where they engage youth and also able to share this widely. So from there, people will be able to then use that little video to then go straight into their Instagram stories. Perhaps they might like to add um, a little bit of extra pledge from their own heart and their own thinking and then share that with all of their friends and family on their network. Mm. Instead of going into a normal art exhibition where everything's static and you kind of might look at a certain picture and kind of like then move on, the joy of augmented reality is that it gets people to dwell a bit longer. You're able to kind of draw them in using moving images and audio to then really get on board with the message that we need to act now for our oceans. We've got quite a lot going on this morning. I'll coach you. Free diving is where we hold our breath underwater for as long as we can. So instead of scuba diving where you have a tank on your back, you are holding your breath, just you and no equipment. This is a one minute dive and a 10 second recovery. Eight years ago, we found a whale shark. Dive. I was snorkeling with the whale shark for about half an hour, and I kept swimming down to where the whale shark was, but I felt like I couldn't stay down long enough. So once I got back to Singapore, I looked for a free diving instructor. This is a two minute dive and you've got 30 second recovery. I really fell in love with free diving as a sport. Five, four. I think free diving is very liberating. Uh, when you are in the water, you are at one with it. So you feel the sensation of the water over your face, your body gliding through it. Um, but also I feel it's very empowering because you're overcoming self-limiting beliefs and you realize you can do so much more than you think you can. Three, two, one, three, three. I think she's more fearless in her private life than she is in, in business, probably because of familiarity. Five. In business, the journey is a bit different. Uh, you need to get into the core of it, get exposure, uh, before you recognize what risk is the right risk and to manage it. I think a lot of next generation that goes into the business in many ways are thrown into the deep end of the pool because their family, more is expected of them. We have a learning curve to experience and so Kath is no different. She will have to go through that challenge of facing greater expectation but at the same time finding her own space and her own role. Every generation is different. But I hope she won't be distracted by that and be clear that her mission is really different, the result she's looking for is different, and the measurement should be different. And so she shouldn't try to be somebody else but herself. Right now, we are driving to Methodist Girls School. This is the school that I went to from the age of seven to the age of 14. And we're going there today because um, I'm really lucky that my mom's an educator and she is fantastic at arts and crafts. So we have an upcoming ocean festival and part of the festival uh, involves a kids workshop where we have kids engaging them with ocean themed arts and crafts. So mum's helping with the arts and crafts portion.
I haven't been back to MGS for about 20 years. Um, I left when I was 14 to go to boarding school in Sydney, and, and the reason for that was that my, my parents got divorced. When I was 14, I thought it would be less conflict for them if I, if I went away, because back then, divorces weren't so common. You'd only read about them in books. So, uh, this sucks. Returning back to MGS was very nostalgic. Picture yourself running around in play areas. I think it's interesting to think about all these experiences that have shaped you as an adult. When I was in primary school, I received an EduSafe bursary, which was given out to kids who had good grades. Um, and when I spoke to my father, he told me that he thought I should decline it uh, so that uh, another a child who needs it more could get it. We all are birthed in a nation that is young, that have used merit-based as the way to measure progress and success. But sometimes merit forget to take into consideration the imbalance of resources and talents of the individual. I know it was a difficult decision for a young girl of 12 years old to say, return your award. I have to actually consider the impact it will have on her because Singapore has promoted a system that winners are good, winners are great. Don't need to consider other people when you win. But as I told Kath during the time, she doesn't need the award. I'm more than happy to fund her education. And I take pride in being able to provide that. And if she could give that up, somebody else who needed it would literally benefit more meaningfully from it unless I start acting according to the values that I believe in then how could I promote the values to her? Nice to see you again. Thanks so much for having me. Bye. It looks awesome. Yeah. Welcome to that the memory was Kathleen's first lesson on the true value of giving, something she's grown to appreciate throughout her career. This is so cute. Yes. Maybe we can look at doing a combination of these mm -hmm. um, for the upcoming kids' workshop. Kathleen now devotes much of her wealth and resources to philanthropy, with a focus on initiatives that contribute to cleaner and more vibrant oceans. I'm extremely, extremely proud of her. She's not one who will wait to watch things change, but she herself will take a role to be a catalyst for that change. Absolutely. I mean, talking about bycatch, that's amazing. I didn't learn about bycatch until I was in my 20s. Yeah. Oh. You know, in this world, we're experiencing climate change now in real time. And I can see her just passing on this love for the ocean. You know, they weren't doing so well. <laughs> so we, we had these hedges done. The Waves of Change Festival is just hours away. Oh. Kathleen and her collaborators have time for a final rehearsal. What we hope our visitors take away from the Waves of Change Festival is that it's important for every one of us to get involved on environmental issues. Change things in your daily life. Uh, think about your own behaviour. Think about things that you want to do to make the world a better place. Manta rays are one of the largest fish in the world. The largest manta ray wingspan ever recorded is 9.1 metres. We started with an idea at the beginning of the year and over the last couple of months, different players have come on board and we've built 
on different components. And I think it's just so exciting to see how willing people are to give to this cause and be a part of it. So it could be now playing. I'll go first. Follow me. I just think it's a fantastic way to showcase art in a very different way. I've never seen anything like that, so I'd encourage anyone to come and have a look. It's, it's truly amazing. Well, I hope a lot of people will take away from that that we all have a role to play in trying to fix arguably one of the biggest challenges we have, you know, climate change. I would definitely encourage especially families to join this event because you actually really get in touch with learning about oceans from different angles, from the workshops from the art showcase, as well as from the audio clips and the films. It's great to hear positive feedback from people um, attending the festival, whether it's that they now feel equipped and empowered to act for the ocean, or whether they feel like they found their tribe. I think all these bits of positivity makes you feel like, yes, we can go out there, we can step up, and we can do something about this issue. We can all just sit back and wait for somebody else to act. But ultimately, you know, the actions of someone like Kathleen show that that one single person has such a massive ripple effect. Those who choose climate change as the area to dedicate themselves, to me, are bigger heroes and are braver because it's never for yourself, it's for the future generation. We all have a voice. What we buy, who we buy it from, what causes we support. I think it's important that we go and do what we think is right. <laughs>